Okay, so welcome everybody back to our next episode of the Coffee Breakdown podcast. Today we have on Paul Moholland, who is a PhD student at the University of Eindhoven. And uh, yeah, so I think Paul, you we've talked many times before, and to what I understand, you're studying plasma turbulence. So let's say we assume that people know everything about fusion, or at least enough, and a bit about plasmas. Let's start from there. And could you give us a brief description of what you study? Yes, absolutely. But first, let me say it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, happy to be at the coffee breakdown. So yes, OK, so I guess it's always a little hard to know where to begin with this with this story of, of what we're doing with Fusion. So I guess our group focuses on uh, turbulence optimization to some extent. And the issue we are optimizing for, I guess, is this thing called plasma turbulence. Uh, and so why we're concerned about this is that in a very low resolution way, in a fusion reactor, ideally you want to keep your plasma core hot because you need heat in order for fusion to occur. And I assume the audience knows this. An issue then would be if heat or particles leave that core and go to the colder edge uh, where we do not want them to be um, because that will inhibit fusion from occurring or at least uh, reduce chances of fusion occurring. A cause of this, say, transport from the plasma core to the edge is uh, turbulence. That's, say, the leading cause of this uh, heat loss in a fusion uh, device. So turbulence, in essence, is something that people are familiar with without them maybe realizing it in day-to-day -day life. Turbulence is chaotic behavior in nature. The weather is governed by it. The milk in your coffee or tea is governed by it. Um, it's essentially chaotic mixing that occurs. So in a plasma, it's, it's a fluid at the end of the day. Uh, it's a charged fluid. And inevitably, there will be some vibrations or perturbations to that fluid. That's going to be unavoidable. So that will lead to, say, a ripple or a wave in the plasma. Now, there are certain um, um, behaviors in the plasma, such as drifts, uh, particle drifts that occur. And that can combine with the ripple, let's say, to actually rearrange the, the composite particles of the plasma such that that ripple grows and that wave grows. And that's an issue because if a wave grows in the plasma, then it's we call this an instability, essentially. This is the mechanism of instability. The wave will grow and that will cause uh, different parts of the plasma to interact and mix. And so that can then, say, bring your hot core plasma out to the edge and colder edge plasma into the core. Uh, reducing the overall temperature of the core of the plasma. You don't want that. Um, eventually, little eddies, which are something like fluid cogs, are in the plasma, little swirls, and particles can be kicked around uh, around these eddies because we have to remember that the plasma is a, is a charged body and there are electric fields, magnetic fields, and lots going on. It's quite complicated, but particles can be um, affected by these eddies and the fields produced by them. Um, and be kicked around from the hot core to the edge. So you can lose your plasma particles in that way. Um, so long story short, turbulence studies, uh, yeah, comprises this study of instabilities that lead to unwanted mixing in the plasma, which could then lead to heat loss or particle loss in your plasma. And that's essentially the essence of, of what we're studying. Okay, and just to bring it back a little bit, because you mentioned this thing about waves, and I suppose that most people, when they think of waves, they think of ocean waves, right? Um, which are kind of these things that are in motion. But I assume those are not the waves you're talking about. Um, probably more like standing waves, like when you have an uh, air column and just the, just the amplitudes kind of go up and down, but they don't really move side to side. Or Perfect. is my picture wrong? Well, you can think of it as like, yeah, like a guitar string wave, a standing wave, like you said, and maybe this wave is kind of moving left to right or right to left in some sense in the plasma. And uh, that's okay. That movement is fine. The issue is if the amplitude of the wave grows. So if the peaks get higher and the troughs get lower, and that's what we would say is a, a, an instability. And um, if you have, say, the wave actually getting straightened out and it becomes flat again, like the guitar string settling and the wave, uh, in a sense, is um, kind of terminated. That would be a stable situation to be in. So that would be a, like a stable mode or stable uh, instability, you could say, which is a bit of a, a terrible name, a stable instability, but <laughs> a stability. Okay. And I guess, yeah, that's that's a very weird naming, 
right? Because we just call them unstable modes, then what's everything else, right? Exactly. <laughs> but I think that the reason I asked that is because it's not the wave itself which moves the energy and particles, although it can, but it's not the, it's the presence of these waves, which then kind of spark something new, this sort of like eddy mixing and all this stuff. That's read the, it's the mixing part that moves everything, but the wave itself doesn't, whereas, or, or does it, and it's sort of a bit more complicated than I'm putting it forward. It's a, it's a great question because yeah, I, I love talking about this because it's kind of, um, interesting how delicate the system is in some sense and how just you change one small thing and then the whole thing is disrupted or unstable but yeah so the wave in a sense um adds this kind of essential ingredient of um, kind of potential energy or free energy that instabilities can tap into um so it, it, the nicest way and the first way I ever grew to understand this this whole turbulence uh, game was by studying something called the trapped electron mode. And there's a very nice cartoon picture you can um, you can think about to understand this. So I'll try to draw it with my hands in some sense. But you can imagine that if you have a slice of plasma, and you could imagine that it is we'll say that it gets more dense as we go up. We'll say that the density gradient points up in this picture of of layers of plasma. Mm -hmm. And then, as I mentioned before, you can start with this, this layer, but a perturbation or vibration might occur, which then causes a ripple in this, in uh, this say, layered plasma picture. Um, so again, highest density is at the top, lowest density is at the bottom. Um, so prior to this ripple occurring, and even during and after this ripple occurs, um, particles are reacting to the to drifts that are present due to the toroidal geometry of our devices. So there are uh, drifts caused by the gradient of the magnetic fields because the magnets in our device are more tightly packed at the center than at the edge. So that leads to an inhomogeneous inhom magnetic field in the machine. There's also curved field lines because again, we have a donut shaped machine, not a straight cylinder. So particles are drifting in reaction to these say geometrical circumstances. Uh, and they're moving back and forth in this picture left and right. Um, and that's gonna be happening throughout the process. The issue then occurs that when you have this wave on top of that left and right movement, um, remember this is a wave in, in, uh, in density, let's say, so the density gradient points up. Um, we could imagine that as we say create a wave in our system, um, we then have say periodic points where the density is higher, if you look at one horizontal slice, beside uh, regions where the density is lower because we could think of a straight line and that in the original state before the perturbation occurred, it's constant density at that line. You then ripple that uh, the wave around that line, but still keep your line horizontal. And then you've got high density, low density, high density, low density, because some of the low density parts of the wave have moved up, the high density parts have moved down. And it's that wave on top of the original drifting that then leads to say, um, more particles moving in one way than the other, some electrons move this way, ions move this way. Um, this kind of periodic nature of the wave leads to periodic uh, charge buildup. That in its own right leads to electric fields forming, which then actually makes that wave grow if they are positioned in a certain way. So it's a bit complicated. Maybe uh, I, I don't know if I fully described this in a clear way, but essentially, yeah, the wave provides the, the potential for things to go wrong. The drifts were already there, but you add the... the the wave there and periodic uh, densities, or it could be periodic uh, high and low temperature regions, if it's an ion temperature gradient mode, for example, those two things create this deadly uh, recipe that leads to instability growth and then eventual turbulence as the wave will grow and hot core plasma goes out, cold edge plasma goes in, as I mentioned before, and yeah, you have your turbulent state. So it really needs this second ingredient, which is these drifting particles that are kind of going across because if the wave existed but all the particles were still let's say not moving then it would it cause this sort of next level effect which is the turbulence which then everything kind of gets moved around even more because of that precisely yeah they're the both both ingredients are essential exactly and either one on their own is not so harmful but the two together 
leads to the instability, which leads to all the trouble. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, because I, so I was talking earlier with Josephine Prohl so in a previous episode, and we kind of boiled it down to you can, you can do the optimization in two ways. One is you can kind of get rid of, uh, well, the idea is that we don't want to get rid of the gradients because that's what defines our hot core. But then afterwards, you can kind of try to remove the source of the waves, or you can try to remove or minimize its the, the connection between these drifting particles and that wave, right? Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so is that a good way to look at it, this optimization thing, or is still one method better than the other when we're talking about optimization? It's a good question. Yeah, I think it is a good way to look at it. Um... So I, I, I've kind of assumed many things in my description about which way the particles drift and so on and so on. So um, indeed, you can change something like the geometry such that you actually change the direction in which the particles drift, hmm. such that instead of them amplifying that wave that I said um, leads to the instability, they actually dampen that wave. Um, so things like that can be maybe tapped into. Uh, and it, again, that's, that's geometric optimization to yeah, change the, the setup of your curvature, let's say, in the system. You can also then uh, offset um, things like, how would we say? Yeah, so there are regions of, uh, let's say, bad curvature, and also there are magnetic wells. And mm -hmm. so magnetic wells are just regions where the magnetic field is particularly low. And so in those wells, that is where you will find your trapped particle populations, let's say, because those are the particles that are trapped and necessarily they are trapped in wells. And then there are these regions of bad curvature, which just means that the particles drift in a direction such that they amplify the original perturbation that I discussed earlier. If they drifted in the other direction, they might dampen the wave, but they drift in the bad direction, then yeah, you're in trouble. So you can try to say, look, those two regions where's the fuel of the instability i.e the trap particles if it's the trap particle mode where is the region uh, that enables those particles to drift in a direction we don't want them to that's another region let's say let's not let those regions overlap let's keep them mm. separate let's keep our fuel of the instability separate from the places where when they drift they drift in a direction we don't want them to um so that's kind of a nice clever way of of say optimizing for a certain instability um, and so, yeah, because the drifting will always be there in some sense, uh, unless you can make your, your donut so large and aspect ratio so small that the particles feel like they're moving in straight lines, that they're moving, uh, almost like the large Hadron Collider, where mm. if you're walking along that device, apparently it just looks like a straight line, but you're gently moving in a curve, but you just don't realize it. Um, so yeah, if you could do that, then yeah, maybe you could, uh, avoid these drifts that are in the process or sorry in the system um but even then if you remove those you still have your waves and so on and perturbations and as you said necessary gradients to actually have a hot core somewhere in the machine yeah so uh, in that sense it's like the fuel is for these sort of instabilities is always going to be there in some way either by design or by nature and so the only optimize, or at least the best form of optimization is just, as you said, keeping the fuel away from the, the, the vehicle, let's say the, the, these drifts that are moving around. Um, yes. Okay. Exactly. That's yeah, interesting. That's, that's yeah. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. You were going to say something. So um, I wanted to maybe, uh, yeah, harken back to what you had mentioned before. Um, so you were asking about what is the best way to maybe attack these problems to, to, say to solve them in some sense and i guess i want to maybe emphasize the point that kind of like what you said in your last remark yeah you know, these things will always be there like it's it's natural for there to be turbulence let's say it's it's a it's a phenomenon we'll never fully quench and we shouldn't ever expect to be able to really terminate it uh, indefinitely it's something that we just want to bring down to a manageable level, let's say. So let's let's keep our pragmatic glasses on and say, okay, how do we minimize this such that we, it's still there, but it's not causing a huge amount of harm. It's not a showstopper or, uh, you know, it's not gonna totally 
destroy your machine or say ruin our chances of actually having a sustainable machine running. Um, so that, that's another aspect is that we are optimizing the machine to minimize these issues, but um, just to keep in mind, yeah, that we'll, we'll never fully stop them, let's say. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. And like, I mean, that's the whole, you know, current mainline pathway eater demo, et cetera, is hmm. that we're never really going to get rid of turbulence or whatever. We just make the machine bigger because the turbulence sort of defines the gradient that you can sustain. Mm -hmm. And if you just have a larger volume of plasma, then that gradient just continues to build, right? Yes. And so it, it's a very rough way of looking at it, but that is effectively oh, the main life strategy, right? That, Indeed. okay, Indeed. just by taking our, our known limitations and then just adding volume, we eventually get to the temperatures that we would want to achieve the fusion reaction. Exactly. But there are other ways, like, I mean, that's clearly a very low tech way of looking at it. Maybe if I could dare to say that one, <laughs> like, it is, yeah, but there are other ways, right? Like, uh, indeed. Yeah. So yeah, there's different, different approaches. Um, and that's what keeps this field so interesting. I think is that there are, well, yeah, I'll use a terrible phrase from Ireland that there are many ways to skin a cat. Um, <laughs> Which is an idiom that makes very little sense, but <laughs> hardwired in. Yeah, yeah. Well, why would you want to skin a cat in the first place, right? Is exactly. the great question, but okay, yeah, continue. Good question. <laughs> we'll take that for the next podcast. So, yeah, I guess, yeah, as you've already spoken with uh, Ralph Mackenbach, so he's, mm -hmm. he's researching available energy, which is another kind of interesting way to look at these issues. And it's, it's in essence, related to what we already talked about. And um, available energy is something that, yeah, it's, it's essentially the amount of energy that is available for instabilities to tap into, to then, to then grow. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very clever way of maybe pulling the plug on instabilities from the source. You know, if you just r remove the, the fuel or the food source of instabilities, no instabilities, they starve, they have nothing to thrive on, um, or at least minimize that available energy, uh, for, for practical purposes. So that's another way of looking at it, uh, which I find quite nice. And, but there are, yeah, so there's, there's very interesting and surprising findings in turbulence research and in instability research. One, which I found quite nice was, uh, it was a comparison between one device, the helically symmetric device, HSX, and also a more quasi axisymmetric device, NCSX. And if you look at these machines in terms of linear instabilities, one does not fare quite as well as the other. HSX seems to be in more trouble when you look mm -hmm. at its um, vulnerability to, to linear instability growth and the thresholds at which those um, modes become unstable. Non-linearly, however, HSX is surprisingly better or in some scenarios operates um, with, uh, with lower levels of, of heat loss or heat transport than the other device, which seemed better in the linear picture. And what's interesting is that um, we have to keep in mind that there aren't just unstable modes in the system, there are stable modes, and they might be our friends if we can get them to work for us in some sense. Uh, so you need to look at the full picture, um, looking at just how instabilities grow and how quickly they grow and when do they start to grow, all well and good. That is the source of the turbulence after all. However, we also want, want to know um, what about what causes these uh, instabilities to, in some sense, saturate, to stop growing, and you reach a steady state kind of system, and there is, say, a finite amount of, of heat transport at a certain level, but indeed, at least the, the instabilities have stopped growing. And interestingly, in, in this comparison of the two devices that I mentioned, um, one, the one that does not do so well linearly does better non-linearly because it actually has access to more stable modes in the system and they actually help in the nonlinear picture with um with saturation because mm. they can actually in some sense yeah energy can be say transferred from the unstable modes via marginal modes which are neither stable nor unstable to stable modes and that's an unexpected thing i suppose like if you just looked at the linear picture and you just said okay instabilities are growing very quickly in this machine that's that's a bad thing but if you look at the next stage of the of the process, you see, ah, okay, but by us having many unstable modes, we seem to have also many stable modes. 
and they can interact in a complicated and unintuitive way to actually help with the operation of the device. So there's always these like maybe nuances that need to be looked at and these surprising details. And again, yeah, the, at the end of the day, the, the main thing we can control is geometry and different aspects of geometry. But um, yeah, there are many, say, details in the geometry, which might say they might be, yeah, the key to this lock of turbulence problems. And um, we, we are still figuring out what we can really do with a machine. What do certain geometrical parameters imply in terms of instabilities and turbulence and looking at things from the linear perspective, but also keeping in mind the more complicated, but more close to reality, nonlinear perspective. And yeah, that's just a, a long ramble about how things are not quite so simple as we might expect them to be or hope them to be. Yeah, I mean, I'm uh, first going to ask a technical question, but that does open the door to sort of a segue. But let's start with the technical question. Perhaps you could elucidate or explain a bit how the connection between the unstable modes and the stable modes exist. I mean, it's just sort of the way, I guess, the simple picture we built up earlier of how the instability, the instability drives this single wave. I guess mm -hmm. with a uh, mm -hmm. with a particular pattern, um, and then what I guess you're saying is that there are other patterns in the in the geometry which are not driven by any instability, but somehow they interact. So maybe you can just sort of explain why or how that happens, and and thus why we need to care about the full picture. Right. So yeah, I won't I won't claim to know the the full ins and outs of this process, but it's essentially a coupling between modes that are of similar size. Okay. Sense. So you have an unstable mode with some wavelength, and then you might have a, a marginally stable mode, which is of comparable size, but it's not growing or decaying in the system. And then you might have a mirror image of the unstable mode. And it's so it's a stable mm -hmm. mode, similar wavelength once again, um, but it's actually, it has a negative growth rate. So it has like a damping rate, I suppose. And uh, the proximity of these instabilities or um, these, these modes which are of comparable size, I suppose you could maybe think of it as a resonance between uh, these different structures which are all of comparable wavelength. And um, that, that's, that's kind of where my, my understanding stops, I suppose. So this is something I will be looking at more so in future. Um, I, I find it very interesting, but also it's, it's a, it seems to be a very promising thing to consider. Um, how these, yeah, how, how we can exploit having these stable modes in the system such that we can actually drain energy from the unstable modes, which are causing the uh, the turbulence and the heat loss. Um, but yeah, that's essentially it. It's, it's a kind of a three wave mismatch uh, kind of coupling scenario. Um, right. This, this, I guess what you're saying is like a chain of resonances, right? Like, so yeah. there are multiple dimensions, but if there's a coupling on any one of them that allows energy or at least something to move from the unstable mode to something else. And then if that new one has some sort of commonality with another mode, then it can just keep going down the chain and transferring energy. Exactly. Right? Like, is that, that's more or less what I'm getting. Yeah. It's kind of like a dissipation into uh, the different modes in the system indeed. And okay. um, the key thing with this, yeah. So the, the main say characteristic, as far as I'm, I'm aware, that leads to this kind of scenario where there are many modes in the system for which this saturation can occur. It's it's the characteristic of, of shear. So mm -hmm. uh, magnetic shear is, is a geometric characteristic, um, which essentially tells you, so if, if, if we know that the field lines are somehow twisted in a fusion device, like the lines on a barber pole, then you can look at two neighboring layers radially in the plasma. And you can look at how quickly does that rate of turning change from one mm -hmm. layer to the next. And we define that kind of rate of change of line rotation as shear. Uh, and uh, it seems that yeah, low shear devices give more kind of space for more modes to exist in the system. And that might seem bad when you think, OK, now there's many inst unstable modes in the system. But we keep in mind that there are also now many more stable modes in the system that might enable this, say, alternative route of saturation to occur, which might be, yeah, very beneficial in a kind of a, a physically realistic scenario. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll refrain from going any farther into this because it's something that I still need to uh, learn more about and I don't want to misspeak. 
I've read no, the topic. fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. But I agree, it's very cool. It's sort of like our previous conception of minimizing the amount of the domain of where fuel exists. Yes. Or, or these interactions <laughs> exist also limit the potential solutions that we have to solving that like the same problem. That's, exactly. That's really kind of cool. <laughs> exactly. I'll make maybe one more remark in yeah. that I, I was asking Ralph about this recently. Um and because in my mind I had always thought that available energy was was something that we wanted to minimize just kind of in a low resolution mindset because that is the fuel for instabilities. But then we discussed a little bit and um, we were saying about how it's not only unstable modes that feed from available energy, it's also stable modes. So we might need to be more nuanced in terms of this idea of uh, is available energy something we want to minimize necessarily, or I guess we'd want to minimize where it goes, <laughs> what feeds from it in some sense, if you could pick and choose. Um, well, but well, another thing sounds... makes me... Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. go. Well, go just ahead. one other thing was that, uh, yeah, I, sh I should have mentioned before that maybe a more commonly known, say, saturation mechanism of turbulence is the zonal flow, hmm. which is kind of like this ring like structure, which is like rotating and shearing modes in, um, in a, you could think of it in, in a tokamak device, maybe. It, it's more simple. Uh, so if you take a poloidal cross section and you have this kind of ring of constant electrostatic potential rotating and so on, and it, it acts almost like a barrier from the core to the edge. And it means that particles aren't just being kicked around by small eddies out to the edge. They actually drift along this kind of barrier, let's say, instead. And they kind of, yeah, so the two maybe saturation mechanisms that we're considering now is that one, which is essentially, say, yeah, we think of the zonal flow as being the mediator of, of say, energy, let's say, from uh, unstable modes to stable modes. And this other picture I was talking about with this kind of three-way resonances, let's say, um, is where you kind of swap out the zonal flow for these marginal modes, which are neither stable nor unstable. So they're like mm -hmm. the new mediator, let's say, that allow energy to cascade from unstable to stable modes. Um, it's less well known and it's less well understood, but we kind of can think of maybe these two saturation mechanisms kind of bluntly as is energy being scattered or being sheared and it's uh, say sheared by a zonal flow or scattered by these or through these modes let's say that are in the system yeah oh okay fair enough i think that well that sounds like a very interesting issue even for me it seems like it's a a nice rich space to do a lot of cool studies in um, but sure. I wanted to take the segue now. Yes, then, absolutely. Uh, which is sort of like in this discussion that we've had just up until now, it appears to me that you kind of are looking at the physics from more of a, a theoretical standpoint, like a mathematical mm -hmm. point of view. It's, it's, it's physics in the strict physics sense. It's like, okay, we, we look at the problem and we try to analyze what's going on through equations and maybe some simulations. Mm -hmm. And that's a very large, I guess, I guess it's a, it's a big difference from a lot of the other previous guests I've had who have, have arrive at their conclusions from a more engineering approach where we sort of design an experiment, we sort of run it in physical reality with all of its, you know, all of the noise and all of the its messiness and try mm -hmm. to extract out the important information from what we see in, or are able to measure in the experiments. Mm -hmm. um, in that sense, is there like, I want, I want to hear from you, how do you think there's a difference between these two approaches to science or is there advantages of one or disadvantages of one? Um, how do you see it? Yeah, I like this question. Um, so I'm still trying to answer it myself, to be honest, but I'll give you my proxy answer. From no, what fair I... enough. Uh, it's an opinion. Yeah. Cool. So, yeah. So in my experience, I've been kind of leaning and edging toward the practical world more and more in the past years. So just as some background, um, I did my bachelor in theoretical physics in Ireland, and then my master's in theoretical physics in Utrecht. And then I did a small internship with Josephine Prohl about trapped electron modes. And that was my segue into fusion and the world of practicality, but the theoretical side of that practical world. So still able to straddle the line between theory and practice, which I quite like. Um, 
but from my experience of the purely theoretical world, um, <laughs> even though what I'm doing now is technically the theoretical side of fusion, it is by far the most practical thing I've ever encountered compared to what I used to look at, which was more cosmology, string theory, quantum field theory, and a bunch of others. So uh, yeah, it, it doesn't seem like what I'm doing is pragmatic or practical, but to me, it's the most pragmatic or practical thing I've touched on. Um, but to be fair, yeah, so I think there's a, yeah, there's a, a pitfall that theorists will fall into in terms of we're kind of sometimes more concerned about what's interesting as opposed to what's useful. So mm. we, we have academic curiosity, sure, and that can sometimes be our main incentive in terms of what we do and what we study, and we're kind of funded by practicality. So it's kind of this war of the worlds of we want to do what we think is cool and interesting, but we need to also look at it or kind of, yeah, maybe refine our selection of uh, things to research by what's actually needed in the, in the real world. And maybe a good place for us to connect to the real world is by talking with, ex with experimentalists and actually um, proposing ideas for real life experiments and so on that can kind of, you know, mix these two worlds quite nicely. Um, so, but there are yeah. there are also advantages, right? To I mean, mm. such in depth knowledge of what is happening and what the theory says, and you know how, in your case, these different modes interact, and how even like the stable modes, which like this type of stuff would never show up in an experiment because you can't physically see the modes interacting. It's just all one big mess of of right. of interactions. So in some sense, I would have expected also the theoretical, your theoretical background has enabled you to really dig deep into these practical problems in a way that a purely practical person may not uh, be able to or may not appreciate. That's, or, yeah. Yeah. or do you not have that sentiment? I, mm, yeah, I, I'm wary to, uh, <laughs> to say theorists have much wisdom or the most wisdom uh, uh, in, in this world. I think there are things that we overlook that we don't understand that we are just out of touch with. Um, indeed, okay, yeah, we, we, we claim and we wish to have a deeper understanding of what's going on. And really, yeah, that's that's kind of the idea of what we're up, what we're up to. And like you said, indeed, an experiment may not show you what's going on with these, these modes and so on, but indeed, if we can build a theory that we can then verify and then validate with experiment. Um, it's very satisfying in some sense. Mm -hmm. And you really feel like you're holding a magic wand in some way because you're just able to do things or maybe see things and understand things in a very fundamental way, which um, you really need the, the theory to, to get and to understand. And I think it's, I think, yeah, you need to dovetail the two worlds of, of theory and experiment because um, we can often wander off and, and lose touch with what's actually experimentally relevant like mm. in terms of the parameters we use in our theory and um we we need kind of to be reined in or to be on a leash in some sense um that an experimentalist holds <laughs> because otherwise we will wander and we will, mm. we will we will lose track of what's actually important and useful but yeah i think i think yeah both sides are, are essential i would i would say um so something we're looking at at the moment is we're, uh, so my PhD research is primarily about electromagnetic turbulence and uh, a key instability in that world is the kinetic ballooning mode. Uh, it is something that we suspect will be very important and uh, very uh, yeah, relevant to study going forward as we move into more and more experiments. Um, and we've actually proposed something experimentally to test, but based on the theory. So this mm. will be a nice kind of test case to see, okay, we, we predict this with, with theory and with simulation. Let's see now if we actually try something analogous in real life in Wendelstein 7X in the upcoming campaign. If we try these different scenarios that we suggest might be helpful, uh, will we see yeah, a corresponding um, improvement in, say, reactor performance? Hmm. Um, so it, it's always good to kind of yeah, keep in touch with, with what's going on experimentally and to kind of rein in what you do theoretically. But indeed, yeah, the theory is great to... to yeah, experiments are for how and theory is for why, I guess. Mm. Maybe that's how I would think about it. But indeed, that mixes. And sometimes we provide the how and they provide the why. 
and it's always it, it's always more complicated than you expect but that's part of the fun I think. But that is that you're right. I think that's sort of like the ultimate test of a theory is whether it's able to make predictions that would be true in the physical world, right? Um, then you know at least the theory has it can hold some water. It may not yes. be perfect because which theory is perfect, but still <laughs> it can hold exactly. some water. For sure, for sure. And and uh being disproven is, is phenomenal because it just closes a door then, right? It kind of narrows down the search or it tells you what your theory was missing. It tells you what your shortcomings were and, and so on. What kind of blind spots did you have? Um, so either way, a result is a result. And we will not, uh, say, question the experiment. So long as we know that the experiment was run correctly, uh, the theory has to adapt to mm. the experiment in some sense. At the end of the day, it's the model and the experiment is the reality. So um yeah we respectfully have to uh, take the slap on the wrist when we've when we've gotten something wrong but uh the theory at the end of the day yeah should hopefully provide the insight that we need to understand and provide the wisdom going forward of what to do and how to guide experiments in future so it, it really is dovetailed i think yeah hmm. it's, it's it's an interesting interplay well that's that that is an interesting opinion too because i think there are also i have met theoreticians who are who are very strictly in the field of theory right they do not only are they a bit out of touch with what is possible inside an experiment but they also just don't necessarily have any ambition to try their theories in in a real world experiment of some sort right. or in a real world scenario even and I, I i think that yeah i agree with you that it is good to take some humility there and just say well, we have to try, right? I mean, this is the this is the real proving ground, right? So exactly, exactly. And actually, this is the precise kind of mindset that brought me away from the purely theoretical realm of say string theory and so on and into fusion. And it's because hmm. we have theories that we can actually test <laughs> uh, in an actual machine. And <laughs> I hope I'm not remembering this, but I think I, I remember hearing that if we wanted to build an experiment that could test string theory. All the string theorists now will be protesting at my door soon but anyway <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say it anyway i think that yeah if you wanted to build an experiment that could really test string theory in a robust way you would need to build something like the large hadron collider but it would have to be the size of the solar system something like this something like really that. okay but again don't <laughs> think this is just a, a ballpark kind of description of what you would really need practically to be able to test such a thing as string theory, to have the energies required to be able to test the theory. And uh, I see, I see. Is, to get the energy, I see, okay. <laughs> yeah, right. And once, once, once you get to that point, I just feel, okay, well, I could have all the wrong or right theories in my career as a string theorist, and I'll never know if I was right or wrong. And I think that can lead to uh, toxic hubris. And I think fusion is like, it's really on the cusp of, theory and experiment needing each other to move forward and continuously relying on each other to move forward i think that's a beautiful place to be and i think that's why it's so nice because you still have the wonderful beautiful physics of of uh, um of yeah of reality and you can look at the theory side of things but in this kind of sandbox of well make sure it's useful also at the end of the day don't just do something arbitrarily for the sake of, of interest but there is plenty of um say ripe fruit in this world of fusion uh for a theorist so i think it's it's a great it's a great kind of uh, middle ground to find yeah okay and i i think that there are at least to my knowledge um fewer and fewer like pure theorists in the fusion world right. at least i don't meet them if, if they exist they're I don't meet them for some reason, <laughs> but I think that that's that's very interesting. That it's also maybe because the field is encouraging this type of, you know, two way communication that encourages people to kind of step out of their bounds, right? Just not only the theoreticians to kind of prove their theories in in experiments, but also for experimentalists to, you know, dip their toes into understanding the deep physics of their of their of their plasmas because they're obviously very complicated <laughs> yeah, precisely precisely so i think yeah there's 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 something to be said for practicality but also there are dangers when you uh, drive blind in some sense mm -hmm. when you don't really know what is under the hood 
And I think, yeah, I, even though you don't need to know how an engine works to drive a car, you might treat the car a little bit better knowing what's actually under the hood in some sense. And I think that's the thing, yeah. So maybe there is the insight that can be provided to experimentalists to guide the experiments better with theory. And then indeed we can base the theory on things that are actually testable in some sense. Um, but yeah, uh, I no, yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I don't know, or I never, I rarely meet pure theoreticians in, in, in fusion. They, they seem to be a rare breed, let's say. <laughs> but I like being surrounded by experimentalist people because it, it really helps remind me of what we're actually doing and why we're doing it. And um, yeah, I, I could complain about bugs in code, but if a part of an experiment breaks, it's, it's, it's another story. And it's uh, uh, maybe potentially much more expensive and kind of wakes you up to... Um, to your problems i suppose okay well i i'm going to ask you this question sure anyway but i have a feeling i know your answer do you feel that the theoretical parts of fusion are in some way not as i wouldn't say advanced but not as elegant right because of the fact that there's a lot of experimental input often right that there's it's just do you find that coming from a pure theoretical background that some certain things you or equations or constraints you look at them and say, well, you know, this just ruins everything <laughs> the deal, or or is it really um, a challenge that you're excited to take on? Well, hmm, it's a good question. I actually don't even know if I have a a straight answer to it. Maybe you know my answer better than me. Um, uh, well, I thought I knew, but I guess I don't. So yeah, but I'm curious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know. So I'm I'm not somebody that kind of fawns over equations. It's like, oh, this isn't this a beautiful equation, and so on and so on. I'm not. No, I, I'm not that kind of person. Sadly, uh, I think I'm a little bit. I'm a philistine in that regard. So <laughs> I love the approximations that we can make that <laughs> make things a little bit simpler. And I'm sure a pure theorist would would scoff at, at at the assumptions we make or the you know simplifications and the brute force kind of um, editing of the theory that we do to make it actually something we can use. Um, no, I, I don't know. I, I think even though yeah, we're we're doing theoretical work, we're doing it in a very practical sense. Um, and I used to always find that like the pure theory theory that I used to do in the masters was at least for my taste, it was too much. And it was it was too abstract and uncoupled from reality. And other people would remark that, ah, oh, this is beautiful, this is elegant, this is fantastic. And yeah, that's that's there's no denying it. That's true. There, there are those things in, in pure theory, but um I, I don't know if fusion theory is any less good looking for that reason. The fact that we make it, we kind of you know squeeze it into a practical uh zone or I'm not sure if I'm if I'm really answering your question, but well, um, I mean, let's let's right. more give a give an example, yeah. right? Because I mean, approximations are approximations. Those, I think, everyone makes. Even if you're a, a pure theorist, you you eventually have to make some approximations. Um, but I think more, I'm talking about like the empirical stuff, like scaling laws, like saturation rules, even, mm -hmm. which is just tunings, right? Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're mostly just. Maybe there is a physics-based equation, but then there's always some fudge factor slash coefficient in front of them. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. more of that stuff. Right. Um, I, I I find that stuff weirdly satisfying, and and yeah, I don't know. Maybe yeah, that's maybe I'm um, tone deaf in this in this regard. Um, I kind of like the the kind of handcraft aspect to it that we kind of have, and it, it, in some sense, it feels like yeah maybe it's i i think we're, we're we are revealing our ignorance with these fudge factors and such like we are we are showing that we don't really know but we're open to figuring it out hmm. um and we're kind of maybe a bit fast and loose in some sense with some things um but not not in a bad way just that um yeah i don't know it's it's almost like mathematical improvisation <laughs> or something like that right it feels a little off the cuff it feels a little bit um yeah i don't know I, I don't know how to describe it, but I do like this kind of practical approach to to theory in some sense, where we don't have all the rules laid out clearly and we stick with them. We kind of do 
fudge things a bit here and there in some sense to kind of get a feeling for what's going on and then we refine it later and we do things rigorously of course eventually but um maybe you're thinking of or talking about say um like kind of quasi-linear things where you don't really have a clear um say a full understanding at the beginning but you slowly add more terms piece by piece you add more physics in and then eventually it actually matches the the theory very well or something like that i think there's something really nice about that where hmm. you start with the simplest possible working proxy and then only add things when necessary or you allow that oversimplified proxy to show to you what you've missed and what your blind spots are and things like this so there's something kind of nice about this um mm, yeah homemade approach almost that's how it kind of feels um it's it's maybe less pretentious way of doing things in some it's, way or, yeah. it's true it is a it is a lot more honest right um yeah. assuming it gets communicated that it's being done this way yeah which is a secondary concern of course but uh still absolutely it is definitely more honest uh in a ways that like okay we maybe sometimes we we know the deep well we have ways to analyze the deep theory but it's just very cumbersome to do so and so yes one of the best ways to kind of like just drive on forward is to make these you know fudge factors and see where or where they don't match exactly exactly right. i think it's nice to work in both realms because yeah we're not maybe <laughs> we're not unsure of our theory of what's going on in a plasma for example like we have this full gyrokinetic equation which technically should be able to keep track of everything in the system but it's just not computationally tractable right we have time constraints budget constraints and so on and so on so like the theory is there but i think it's even more say elegant when we find a way to make it work for us given the constraints of practicality so i think that's you, you might you might say that you're kind of beating the equation out of shape and you're averaging over this thing and you're oversimplifying it with that thing but i think those are fairly ingenious simplifications to still retain kind of the spirit of the equation without having to go through the brute force of actually calculating every little thing so maybe the thing i have in mind is like the the, the gyrokinetic equation which starts off as a six dimensional thing which we then cleverly squash into five dimensions because that already makes things much easier to compute in terms of time and cost i think that's fantastic like that's just you're kind of prioritizing what you really need from that equation do you need full fidelity no we need to look at specific behaviors that this equation can reveal let's look at the right scales to like narrow that down in some sense and i think yeah there's there's a real um kind of magic to it in that sense uh, right there's a sort of uh genius hidden in exactly how to do the simplification yes right? exactly. i mean it takes a lot of brain power to figure out okay what is extra like what what is just precisely. not related to our current problem precisely you're kind of seeing the wood for the trees and yeah or yeah you're maybe uh the, separating the wheat from the chaff so that's vital i think because yeah we we live in a world where we have limits to our abilities and and so on and so on so i think yeah to, to that that's that's its own genius let's say and that's its own kind of elegant way of doing things because you can you can get philosophical about this and say you know we're only looking at a small part of the of the light spectrum you know the the vis visible light spectrum is the only part that we actually see does that mean that it's the only part that's there or even worth considering of course not uh so we're we're already approximating life through our own eyes every single day right and massively <laughs> massive. yeah like these, yeah, yeah. these insanely tight bottlenecks of the refined amount of frequencies you can actually hear the very small range of things you can actually smell or taste like we're, we're looking we're looking at life through a keyhole and yeah. yeah even even like the focal vision right like it's the very exactly. center of your vision that's actually in any high definition the yeah. rest is just approximations mostly Exactly. actually <laughs> exactly. yeah and they're getting worse and worse every year <laughs> yeah <laughs> but, uh, that's it exactly so at the end of the day we're, we're all modelers in some sense right just just yeah. by just by living and uh, processing what we see and what we prioritize by like what you said what you focus on and and so on so why not treat our our physics tools in a similar way you know pragmatic modelers just like us and once it gets the um the machine running at the end of the day um that's the important thing and 
I think there's nothing more elegant than that, let's say. Yeah, and I think that that that's also kind of an analogy that gets floated around, at least used to in the when I was studying as well. It was that the, I mean, they learned how to fly before they understood really aerodynamics. Yes. If if people waited for the theory, actually, we wouldn't still have airplanes, right? Yeah, so because exactly. we don't really understand it that well, we have like approximate equations, but even those didn't exist when they learned or when they developed the first flying machines. Um, exactly, exactly. Sometimes you just need brave people to just try something. And I think now with the um, kind of the blossom. Of, of, of several startups in fusion i think that's a fantastic sign right because you're going to get that kind of um untethered kind of practicality uh, and ingenuity on the ground and it's like we're getting we're getting fusion research outside of universities outside of um kind of ivory tower academic institutes and into the hands of people that just want to try things mm. and have the the means to do so to afford it and I think that'll that in its own way will will push the field forward considerably and in very important ways that theorists won't predict. And that, well, at the end of the day, yeah, they may need us in some sense. But I think it's great that they are, yeah, like you said, you don't need to know how flying works to be able to fly. Trial and error, and so on. I'm sure that was very dangerous trial and error. But um, yeah, I think at the end of the day, you need both. You need both. Yeah, I'm always I'm always surprised because like here and there through my my channels, like I hear about the modeling exercises done by these these startup companies to try to get their design off the ground. And it's they just throw the kitchen sink at it. They just want everything, all of it. Just tell us how to run it and we'll just throw everything we have at it. Because honestly, like they from where they sit they have nothing to lose by doing so right and they yeah. have they have the incentive to do it and it's always amazing to see like they're they're actually putting components together that i had hoped we were putting together for a long time but like it's just not routine for us for but they're, they're actually going to try it right, right. And that that's very interesting to me because at least it gives me hope that somebody's doing it because we're sure as hell not. Right? <laughs> no, indeed. And I think maybe yeah. some of us need to see it before we can believe it. And yeah, yeah these people that have uh, somehow ducked under the red tape that we have to kind of stay behind. It's fantastic. Yeah, like they, they will they will make leaps and bounds for sure. They will show us things that we didn't know were possible or we didn't suspect could be done, could be made. Um, I'm sure there'll be many mistakes along the way, but that's okay. Um, you need to try you need to try these things um but yeah, yeah it's not it's not to it's not to downplay the risks that they're taking no, right like indeed. definitely they are taking huge risks by going this route of just building the thing and seeing if it works but right. in some ways we all benefit from that and i think that that we, we shouldn't uh, discredit it so quickly no not at right. all not at all um quite the opposite yeah, I admire it for sure. Um, just the the bravery, the ingenuity, just there's no lack of motivation there. They really are just, yeah, they'll just go for it. They'll go mm -hmm. for it in ways and in by faster means than we could ever do in academia, let's say. So academia is maybe the beaten track, but uh, it's good that some people are willing to wander into the woods every now and then because you never know what they might find. So, All right. And on that note, uh, unfortunately, I would like to call this a bit to an end. Do you have any final words maybe on where you think things are going in the field of fusion and, you know, maybe, or what you're excited for that's coming up? Oh yeah. I don't have the wisdom to predict what'll happen, but um, I am, I'm very keen to hear about how the upcoming campaign goes, the experimental campaign of Bendelstein 7X. Hmm. Um, so that'll be in the coming months later this year and early next year. Um, That'll be quite exciting, I think. Um, we're kind of breaching farther into, say, mm, high performance level. Um, right. Yeah, I was going to ask, what, what is exciting about it? Because I don't hear much about W7X. Well, yeah, it's it's probably, um, I'm probably biased because it's it's in relation to what I'm researching for the PhD. So we're looking at, well, yeah, I'm looking at electromagnetic instabilities and uh, these instabilities arise due to um, finite to high plasma pressure. And this is kind of the region we're like, we're delving into, where we're ramping up 
the, the pressure inside Wendelstein 7x of the plasma. That will lead to some interesting instabilities and uh, let's see how well it copes. And I guess, yeah, my research is about trying to delay that, some of these instabilities from occurring. Um, but we will see, yeah, what, what really comes out of uh, these experiments. So watch this space. And so they finally get, they're finally going to hit the high performance or try to hit high performance. I, I don't want to speak out of turn. I, I don't know the exact kind of levels they're aiming for, but right. that's the direction they're walking in, let's say. Well, yeah. that's, if that's the case, that's definitely exciting. I'm, I'm curious to see what comes out of those experiments as well. If sure. they, if they get some sort of benefit from the high optimization at, at high, at high pressures as well. Yeah. We shall see indeed. But uh, yeah, that's, that's all I have in mind for what's on the horizon. Wow. Well, I mean, that, that's great. I, that's a, good news that they're trying and moving forward to that phase. So with that, thanks for coming onto the podcast, Paul. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. conversation. And uh, there, there's still so many questions I have, I want to ask. So <laughs> we worry. might need I'm to record uh, another one. <laughs> for sure. I'm open to a part two or a nice sequel anytime. Yeah. All right. And for all the listeners out there, remember the Coffee Breakdown podcast is just for us to, to learn, not just uh, you guys, but also us here. Uh, myself and my guests. So with that knowledge, we'll see you on the next episode. Bye.